Open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22. That's where we're going to be today. Thank you for being here today. It's good to be with God's family, is it not? Yes. Love the family of God here at Maple View. All right. Well, it's summertime, and summertime means lots of time in the pool for us, and we're teaching our daughters how to swim this summer. And do you know how to teach a, a child to swim? Essentially, you do this. You look at your precious baby. In my case, Lula, or she's about to be four in a couple months, and just look at her in those beautiful blue eyes and say, baby, do you know daddy loves you so much? Daddy, I'm just crazy about you. I love you so much. Whew. And just huck her into the pool. Turn around, huck her into the pool, and let her kind of feel the panic a little bit, and you come underneath her. It's been working very well. Uh, Because it's one thing, right? It's one thing to think you can swim. It's another thing to have no choice but to swim. You understand what I'm saying? And so they're learning very quickly. In fact, we're having a hard time keeping them out of the pool. Uh, They're our water babies. So taken after their dad. I love to swim. So anyways, the reason why I bring that up is because today is all about faith, radical faith. So we're going to look at Genesis 22. For over two months, we've been following Abraham and Sarah. Last chapter, if you remember, was chapter 21, and that was the amazing fulfillment of the promise to Abraham and Sarah. Their son that was promised Isaac, he was finally born. This is the happiest time of their lives. Remember, they've been waiting about 25 years for this promise to be fulfilled. They were both elderly. God promised Abraham a long time before that, that through his descendants, he was going to bless the entire world We know that ultimately from those descendants came Jesus Christ, the one who died for the sins of the world, the Messiah. And so the promised son, Isaac, is born. Abraham and Sarah, they're thankful, they're happy, they're satisfied. Remember, Isaac's name means laughter. So there's lots of joy. The last glimpse we got of Sarah is she's just laughing at the goodness of God. She's nursing this baby child in her old age, and she's just marveling at at God's goodness. Life is perfect. They're beyond blessed, and then everything changes. Genesis 22 is a stark cliff in the narrative because just when this promise is fulfilled, something happens, or we think it's going to happen, that changes pretty much everything. This is the climax of the faith life of the patriarch Abraham. This is the supreme test, the final exam, if you will, for Abraham. So my plan this morning for us is to read the chapter in its entirety, and then we're going to circle back and get some truths out of it, okay? Four different truths that we can pull out of the text. First, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We just pray that your spirit would be using this time right now, speaking into our hearts uh, from the amazing example of Abraham. Father, thank you for the marvelous gift of your word and you communicating with us. Pray that you would speak in spite of me this morning through your word today. Pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's uh, look at verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him, Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. 
So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Verse 15, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Now it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Indeed, Milcah also has come children to your brother Nahor, Huz his firstborn, Buzz his brother, Kemuel the father of Aram, Kesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begot Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother, his concubine, whose name was Ruma, also bore Teba, Aham, Thahash, and Mecha. All right. Very good. So this passage is very disturbing. I mean, just at face value. What do we do with that? Every parent cringes at this story. I mean, you think of your beautiful child and this idea of a sacrifice. I mean, that's honestly quite disturbing. Why in the world... Would God do this? Why would he test Abraham in this way? The story is astonishing. It's stunning. But this is a historical event through which God is revealing to us who he is and what he wants from us as well, not only Abraham. So it's very important. So we need to unpack this and see what lessons are in this story for us today as well. So verse 1, kind of returning back there, we see this. Now it came to pass after these things that God, what does it say? God tested Abraham. So the first truth from today's passage is this. At times, God will test his people. At times, God will test his people. God tested is what it says. Abraham, he's intentionally placed in this crisis so that what is inside his heart will be revealed on the outside. It's a a test. And you know what? This is a, a common theme throughout the scripture, that God tests his people. He does it not only to produce faith, but he also does it to reveal faith, which is what he's doing in this case. Listen to a couple of these scriptures. Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. So God tested the Israelites when they were wandering in regards to the manna. And then Deuteronomy 8, 2. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Psalm 11, verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. And then one more passage, Isaiah thirty-eight ten. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. So we see this all throughout the Scripture this idea of testing, 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 testing. Are you thrilled with this idea, concept, anybody? Probably not. But it's the truth. And you know what? God tests us, too. James 1, 2, and 3 says this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. What does that verse presume? It presumes that we'll undergo testing, trials, tribulations. Why would God do that? Well, our God cares so much about us and our growth and that we trust him that he intentionally lets us experience testing. That way, what we claim on the inside is made manifest on the outside because faith is like a muscle. Faith is like a muscle. It only grows When it's stretched and tested, faith is just like that. Another example, why is school 
not just a string of lectures, over and over lectures, lectures. Why are there tests? Well, there's tests, there's exams, because they show what we know. If we know what we know, is your knowledge illustratable? Has it made a difference? Now, at this point, it's pretty important to separate the idea of, of testing and tempting, because many of us think that those are the same things, to test and to tempt, but they're not the same thing. God never tempts. Actually, James 1, 13 says this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Very strong statement, very clear. God does not tempt you. He may test you, but he doesn't tempt you. Who is the tempter? Satan. Satan tempts us to bring out the worst in us, but God tests us to bring out the best in us. God doesn't tempt to do evil, but he does test. And he does so not to punish us or hurt us, but to stimulate growth within us. The Hebrew word here for test is nisad. It means to put to the proof to try. It shows what someone's really like. It usually involves difficulty or hardship. Listen to this quote from Henry Morris. He says, the engineer may know full well that his design will stand the stress and strain to which it's subjected because he knows it has been designed properly. Nevertheless, the construction specifications will require that it be tested not to assure the engineer, but to assure the public that it will stand. So God tests to assure us, too, of our faith. Some of you are currently being tested, walking through a valley. Maybe you're discouraged. The message from God's word for you today is this. Trust God. He knows what he's doing. This trial, this test, has a purpose. It has a purpose. So let's, let's look into Abraham's test. Verse 2. Then God said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you loved, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. It's like, what? <laughs> That's the part that must have been shocking. As a burnt, did you really just say that? On one of the mountains of which I shall tell you, a burnt offering. Have you ever received news that kind of just made your heart drop? One of those moments is like, whoa. Here's Abraham. He's getting this message from God, and it almost seems like God is calculating his words to hurt him the most. Look at what he says. Take your, your son, your only son, whom you love. This is going to hurt. Now, that word only, the Hebrew is yahed. It's an unusual word. It's not often used, and it means something unique or irreplaceable. There's a Greek word that's parallel with it, monogenes which is the term used in, in John 3.16 for the only begotten son, the only begotten. It's the unique son of the promise. Now, we know that Abraham had another son, Ishmael, with Hagar, but that wasn't the promised son. So when it says only son, it means the only son of Abraham and Sarah, the unique son, the irreplaceable son, the son of the promise. And so God says, I want you to sacrifice the son to me. Sounds crazy. And human sacrifice, that's condemned by God elsewhere. So really what he's doing here is he's not asking them to go through with it. Abraham doesn't know it at that point. We know that God steps in and stops it. But he's just seen to what lengths Abraham would go to believe God. It was a radical test of faith. Would God fulfill his promises to Abraham? Abraham knows two things. He knows that God will bless him with the sentence, through his son Isaac. He promised him that already. I will bless the world through you, through your son Isaac. So he knows that, and he also knows that God just told him to kill that son. So how is he going to reconcile these things? What does he do? So Abraham rose early in the morning. So he's getting an early start on this. There appears to be no hesitation. He obeys God. It says he saddles his donkey. Then he took two of his young men with him, Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. So Abraham responds to God in obedience. And this is the second truth today. True faith will always lead to obedience. True faith will always lead to obedience. He tells his servants to stay behind. Verse 5, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and he will come back to you. He told them to stay because otherwise they would have tried to restrain him from the sacrifice. 
And then verse 6, So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand like a flint and a knife, and the two of them went together. He just obeys. Now none of us have ever been asked to do something this hard, this difficult. Remember what Abraham's been through. Years of waiting. He's had his, his defeats. He's had his victories, his bad days, his good days. And finally, his promised son is born in his old age. He saw God come through in a miraculous way. He learned that God is God and God is powerful. And then, just like that, God said, no, I want you to, I want you to sacrifice him. But Abraham obeys because he's learned that if God is really God, he should obey him no matter the cost. And the Holy Spirit actually uses this example in the New Testament. Look at James chapter 2, 20 and 23. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. In a nutshell, Abraham actually did what God told him to do. That's all that's saying, is that God told him to do something. He obeyed because he believed. He was saved by grace, not by his works, but his faith resulted in works. And true faith always results in works and obedience. We're justified by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. Let me say that again. We're justified by faith alone, but the faith that justifies is never alone. That's a very profound statement. I like to think of it this way, just like keys on a ring. This key right here, the golden key, this is the master key to every door in the church. All right? So this is the big key right here. This is the only key that will do that. It's the only key that will open certain doors in this church. Now, this key is never alone, though, because it always comes with all my other keys. Actually, this is Karen's key ring. It's kind of girly, so you can see that. But it comes with the car key, comes with the house key, all the other keys that we have. The only key that opens the door is this one, but it's always accompanied by other keys. Now, that's exactly what faith and obedience is like. Faith is the only key that opens the door to salvation. The scripture is clear about that. God only responds to faith. But true faith, if you look at the whole counsel of God, true faith is always accompanied by obedience. The other keys. So faith opens the door, but obedience comes with it afterwards. You can say you believe all day long, but if you don't obey, it ain't worth much, according to the Lord. So this is, leads us to our next truth today. The decisions we make reveal who and what we worship the most. Think about this. If Abraham held on to his son Isaac here, he would have been, in effect, worshiping his son Isaac over and above God because he would have valued his son more than the God who gave him his son. He would have valued the gift more than the giver of the gift. But Abraham holds nothing back. So the challenge for us, how do our decisions reflect and reveal what's most valuable to us? Do we hold back from the Lord? What are, what are we spending our, our time on? our talents on, our treasures on? What does that say about our heart and who we worship? Are we willing to give things up for the Lord? So as we read this next part, I kind of want you to picture this in your mind. See it as a movie. Picture Abraham, this elderly man, making this three-day journey. It's about 45 miles from Beersheba up to Mount Moriah. Three-day journey, 45 miles his heart is breaking every step of the way. Verse 7, But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. So Isaac gets confused. He's like, Where's the lamb, dad? Normally there's a lamb for a sacrifice. And Abraham says, God will provide. God will provide the lamb. Now, is Abraham manipulating his kid here? Actually, Isaac's not really a child here. He's, he's more likely a teenager. Many scholars think that he's, 
15 years old, they speculate, which would be old enough to restrain his elderly father if he wanted to. But he asks this question, where's the lamb? Abraham says, God will provide. So is Abraham manipulating his kid? It's a resounding no is the answer to that. No, Abraham has true faith. Listen to this from Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So not once in this story does Abraham lose faith. According to the book of Hebrews, it says that Abraham knew that even if it took a miracle, even if God was going to resurrect his son from the dead, God would provide a lamb. He believed that the same God who provided him and Sarah a child in the first place could do another miracle, even if it meant a resurrection for Isaac. He concluded that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. So pretty amazing. And then It goes on, verse 9. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So Abraham binds his son against this rough wood. I mean, just picture the scene. He lays his son on the altar, binding him first. In fact, the Jewish tradition referred to this whole event as the binding, as that's one of the most significant parts. Isaac willingly lets his dad bind him up. And he lays him down. He takes his knife, maybe some kind of sharpened rock. He lifts it up. He brought it down to slit his son's throat. And right at that moment, an angel screams out from heaven. And this is amazing. Look at verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. That was the sacrifice. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn. Notice God has no one greater to swear to than himself. So he swears to himself. (laughs) I swear to me, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing, I will bless you. It's a super redundant statement. Blessing, I will bless you. You couldn't say it more strongly than that. I'm going to blessingly, blessingly bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. That happened much later in Joshua's day during the conquest. But God is stressing the certainty of the blessing that he's going to give. And then he he reiterates. He says, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. So this story shows us the radical nature of true faith. There was tremendous demands placed upon Abraham. But then there's also incredible blessings when he does believe. And that's still the truth. That's still the truth. God will test your faith, sometimes demanding tremendous things from you, but he'll also bless you incredibly if you do obey. So let's finish off the chapter, and then I want to circle back to one last lesson today. It kind of gives some genealogy. It came to pass after these things that it was told to Abraham, saying, Indeed, Milcah also has borne children to your brother, Nahor. You've got to love these guys' names. Brothers Huz and Buzz. <laughs> Huz is firstborn. Buzz is brother. Kemuel, the father of Aram, Kesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, Bethuel. Once again, ladies, great place to choose your baby names, okay? From the book of Genesis. Bethuel begot Rebekah. Circle that name in your Bible. That's very important. That's actually the point of this section. Rebekah. That name will be tremendously important very soon. These eight Milka bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. His concubine, his name was Ruma, also bore Teba, Geham, Thahash, and Mekah. 
All right, more cool names. The final lesson from this remarkable story today is this. God provides. God provides. The ram dies in Isaac's place. A substitute dies in Isaac's place so that Isaac doesn't have to. And I want you to note the exact wording of this. Look at verse 14. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. Say that. The Lord will provide. What tense is that in? No. Lord provides, it would be present. The Lord will provide is what? Future. Wait a second, that's weird. Future tense, the Lord will provide. The Lord just did provide, right? With the ram. That's very interesting. The Lord will provide Jehovah Jireh. You know what? That's no accident. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said this about Abraham. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, Jesus was saying. And he saw it and was glad. It's my personal belief that God revealed something to Abraham here in this moment. When he provided the ram, when the sacrifice was made, God revealed something to Abraham about the day when Jesus would come. He said, I will provide again. And then 2,000 years later, enter John the Baptist, and he says this in John 1.29. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So I believe that Abraham knew there was a day when another lamb would be provided, and that's the Lamb of God. That's the Messiah, his descendant, our Savior, Jesus Christ, none other. Note, there's so many similarities and just a few differences between this story and what happened with Jesus Christ. Did you know that that area of Mount Moriah, this is a picture of Mount Moriah. That's Jerusalem, folks. That, that mountain it's more of a hill, really. But that hill, Moriah, we have another name for it. It's called Calvary. This is the mountainous country right around Jerusalem. This is the same general location where the temples were built, where lamb after lamb after lamb was sacrificed to atone for people's sins. This is the same place where Jesus died as a sacrifice. Do you think that's a coincidence? No. God was using this event to foreshadow the greatest sacrifice of all time. Abraham actually had to go 45 miles up to this place. And notice there's some other similarities. It was a three-day journey. Jesus died. He was in the tomb for three days. So both three days is significant in both. Jesus, like Isaac, he was an only begotten, miraculously born son, the promised son of the father. Jesus, like Isaac, cried out to his Abba father, In the story, Jesus, like Isaac, he walked up a hill with wood on his back for the sacrifice, but this time it was a cross, right, in Jesus' case. Jesus, like Isaac, submitted willingly to the Father's will, but there's some differences here. Jesus was unlike Isaac in that God the Father didn't provide a substitute for him. See, in Isaac's case, the ram was the substitute. In Jesus' case, Jesus himself was the substitute for who? For us. Praise God. God the Father, like Abraham, knew the pain of sacrificing his son. But unlike Abraham the father in that story, God did not spare his son. Listen to this, Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? What an amazing thing. We have a holy God who has generously provided a lamb for us. Is that not amazing, folks? I just love, well, I love the Bible. Obviously, I'm a pastor. I love the Bible. But I love this passage in particular because it it points to Jesus Christ in so many different ways. It's just amazing to think 2,000 years before Christ came, this all foreshadowed what would happen. And now we're looking back 2,000 years later to what God did do. God provided a lamb for us. And you know what? We're going to see that lamb again. Revelations 22, 3 says, there in heaven there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. We're going to see the lamb of God face to face in heaven. Are you ready for that, fellow Christians? We're going to see our substitute in heaven. What an amazing thing. I would beg you, I would urge you, if you've never put your faith in Christ, 
you got to accept him because he's the substitute. He's the one who died in your place to pay that penalty for your sins. There's no other substitute other than him. He was the perfect lamb of God who shed his blood to pay the penalty for our sins. And then he rose from the grave. And if God did that for us, he's got so many other blessings for us in store. So let's pray and continue to worship God through prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. Lord, we thank you for the story of Abraham and Isaac. It's a bewildering, stunning, astonishing story. Honestly, quite radical. And it makes us uncomfortable. But Father, it it points us to the ultimate sacrifice, that of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. He was a substitute for us. He walked up the hill. He had the cross on his back. He willingly went to that place of sacrifice where so many millennia before Isaac went. And Father, this time, there was no other substitute. He was the substitute for us. And so, Father, we worship him this morning as our substitute, as the go-between between between you, a holy God, and us. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Father, we thank you for forgiving our sins and giving us hope for eternal life. Father, you're so amazing. Today, as we take communion together, we remember what Jesus did on that cross, shedding his blood and atoning for our sins in that act. We remember his body and his blood as we partake of the elements today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.